Hey, Emily Adams here, and today I am going to be sharing part two of my story. If you have not to watch part one, go and watch part one before you actually watch part two, because it will make sense as I lead into part two of my story. And I first off want to just say thank you for all of those that have watched part one of my story and that have been supporting my channel. It is greatly appreciated and it makes it easier to keep showing up and sharing when I get feedback or I know that it's making an impact somewhere. Because at the end of the day, if I can inspire one person or give one person some kind of value, then my job is done. So as I go into part two of my story, um, part one where I left off where it was I had just left in the middle of the night of leaving the Amish culture. And now part two of it is talking about what was next and dealing with uh, some being married to someone that was a narcissist, an alcoholic, and very verbally abusive. And it's not always been easy for me to talk and for a long time I hid this side of it and hid the whole story. I hid behind it and I realized that when you share your story and you keep sharing it, the easier it gets and you heal as you do it. Even though there's times that I will tear up and have emotions and that's okay. Like allow those emotions to really be there. So I left in the middle of the night and I went to... Um, the boys' dad's um, sister's house and stayed there. And that's kind of where I stayed for the next couple of months. And what it, what, what it felt like, I just kind of want to go back and going from living in the Amish culture to now being living in a completely different culture in a completely different home with people that I did not know. I did not know his sister at all. It was very uncomfortable for me to start with because I wasn't used to receiving help or support. I was raised to be, you know, we do everything on our own. Um, and I didn't know what that looked like for me. Like, how do I balance all this? And the culture shock really didn't hit me until a couple weeks in. I realized, wow, like, this is crazy. It's crazy. Some of the craziest things that I found was... People were really like, if I told someone that I left the Amish, I would get the craziest questions. And after about having five or six incidents like that, I was like, you know what? I am not telling anyone that I used to be Amish because I am sick and tired of all these questions people have. But now I can look back and just see like people were curious, right? They're just curious about like what the culture was or how it is. And I can see that now, but it triggered me and I didn't want to share it. So I'm living there and the, one of the uh, first things that I did was actually get my hair cut. Um, I went from having long hair like all the way down to like the middle of my back, like down to like almost my butt area where it was so long and so thick. And as you can see, naturally curly um, and it just like frizzed out. So the first thing I did, I was, I was like, I wanted to get my hair cut. So got it cut. So I got it cut pretty short. And I didn't know what I wanted. Like, I wanted to go get my hair cut. And the lady asked me, like, what kind of cut do you want? Do you know what you want? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, just, just cut it. And she was like, well, do you want layers? Like, I'm like, how is there so many different cuts of haircuts? Like, how? Like, I, it, I my mind was blown at it. She cuts my hair. She finishes it. And um, then I ended up going to get clothes. And picking out clothes was so difficult for me. I had no idea. I knew that I was never ever gonna buy a dress and for years I didn't wear dresses or even buy one because that's what I lived in and I hated it. I hated it. So I refused to buy a dress for the longest time and picking out clothes was just like, what goes with what? What's style? What's not style? And it would stress me out so much. And just to like figure out like, what do I want to wear? It was awful. It was so hard for me like to decide. It was freedom, but at the same time, I had no idea like what fit with what or what should you wear? What shouldn't you wear? And all these like fashion rules that I still don't understand and that's okay. I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, so went to go get my hair cut, got um, some clothes, and then I started looking for jobs because I wanted to get a job to support myself. And I had applied for it to work at a restaurant. And in the interview process, 
And mind you, this is the first interview I've ever had. I'm 17. I just need a job. I just need some kind of income. I don't have my license yet. And in the interview process, the lady that was interviewing me, she made the remark that I wasn't necessarily a waitress because I didn't really seem to have it all together and I wasn't outgoing, but she would use me to prep food. I wasn't good enough to be a waitress, but I could prep food. And I was like, okay, perfect. Like, I know I have a work ethic and I will outwork like anyone. And so I started the job there. I was super excited, right? It was minimum wage and worked there for a couple months. And what I realized working there is going from that kind of culture to a culture to something completely different. I worked with some people that did that had zero work ethics, zero. They would do the bare minimum. And that drove me crazy. Like I would sit there and be like, man, we could do without half of these people. Like I could do four people's jobs because we're just prepping food. But it took like eight people because of the fact that no one was really doing their job. And it drove me crazy. And I used to get like a lot of hate for like working so hard. And they'd be like, yo, why, why do you work so hard? Like why? There's no point. Like just do the bare minimum. And it bothered me. It bothered me so much. And that was one of the culture difference. I, I was like, well, maybe that's just because of how I was raised and how I was programmed. So keep in mind, not all the Amish are programmed that way. It came from my family. And I'm very appreciative for my family for teaching me how to work hard and how to like put in the work. Um, and then from there, it was like the language I was not used to. So in the Amish culture, we never cussed ever. And if you follow me on Instagram stories or listen to my podcast, you know that has since changed. I drop a little, some F-bombs and that's okay. Like it's who I am. I just embrace it. But I wasn't used to the cussing or like the language they were using or, and some com com conversations made me feel very uncomfortable. So anything about like sex or crazy things that they were doing on the weekends, I was like, dang, like I thought like, I was crazy just for drinking them, but apparently like there's drugs. And I knew like in different parts of the Amish culture, there are drugs, but I was never around that. I was more around the crowd that would just drink. Like we would just drink just to get drunk because that's what we did. We were, we didn't have anything else to do besides play sports and get drink, get drunk or do whatever. And I wasn't really used to, you know, the fact of like getting high and stuff. And it just like really... Well, I was like, wow, like this is a whole other level and a whole other difference. Like it just, it just blew my mind. And I worked there for a couple months and realized like, this isn't going to cut it. And it wasn't something I enjoyed doing. And then I transitioned to start working at, working for a trainer and at a racetrack. And there I helped with the horses, which is, it was in my zone. Like I loved it. Um, I got to like drive the horses, take care of them. Like, and on race day, I would always take the horses in, in the paddock and like take care of them until the trainer came or the driver came and took them out on the race. And afterwards I would take care of them. It's what I did. And meanwhile, I had went to go get my license. That was, that was quite the thing. So I actually, uh, drove, as soon as I got my permit, I was, so I was 17 to get my permit and I could not, um, get my license for another six months. I actually drove while I had my permit and I can still remember I still had my driver's permit and I actually sideswiped somebody, which was like the most horrific, like I thought the world was ending. I sideswiped this person. I only had my permit. I didn't know what was going to happen. Like I felt horrible and I felt horrible for the other person. The other person was not very nice. And it was like my first time ever being in an accident. I didn't know what to do. I was freaking out. And then I ended up getting a um, ticket for like driving without my real driver's license. And eventually I got my dr real driver's license. Like I think it prolonged it by like two months because I had gotten a citation for it. But I was super nervous um, getting my driver's license because I didn't know this person that was doing like my driver's test. Like it just made me so, so nervous to get my driver's license. And the written test, I actually failed the written test before I actually passed it and got my permit. 
So that was quite the process of getting my license. But once I, once I got my license and the more I drove, the more comfortable I felt. Um, and realized soon, um, and many more speeding tickets later, I needed to slow down. <laughs> um, but back to um, working at the racetrack, uh, it was then during that time that I actually found out that I was pregnant. And I had moved in with uh, with him um, maybe a month or two earlier. I'm not sure where it was. But I found out I was pregnant. And the crazy thing about it is, is growing up in the Amish culture, like, my mom didn't teach me about periods. Um, yes, I knew how people got pregnant. But I didn't know, like, hey, this is your cycle. This is how it works. Like, all these things, right? I didn't know. And I wasn't smart enough to, you know, track that stuff. Because you don't know what you don't know, right? And I thought the morning I woke up, I thought, man, I, I just had the flu. Like, I just feel like shit. And I can't, like, I couldn't pull myself out of it. And I was like, well, I'm just going to take the day off, you know. I'm just sick. Like, I just have the flu. And then the next, then throughout the day, like, I, I started feeling better. And I was like, okay, so I'm just getting over it. But then the next morning, I got it again. And it took me, like, three mornings to figure out, okay, this is not normal. And I didn't really Google a whole lot before then. And I was like, I was telling them like, man, I just don't feel good. And so I went and got a pregnancy test. And that was like one of the most difficult times to be alone because he wasn't involved at all. Like I went and got a pregnancy test and did it. It wasn't like something that we had talked about. We didn't really talk about having children. We didn't really talk about getting married um or any of that stuff and I felt so alone and when I took the pregnancy test and I realized I was pregnant I was like there was this moment of me just crying because all I wanted to do was to have my mom and for her to tell me that I was going to be okay and I remember sitting there crying and thinking holy shit like I'm 18 and I'm going to be a mom this is not what like I had planned in my life. It's not what I had wanted. But yet a part of me was super excited because I knew like, I always believed that everything happens for a reason. And I knew that I would be okay no matter what. So I told him I was pregnant, you know, and of course he was like, he was excited or, you know, whatever. But being raised in such a strict religion and culture, it was like, as soon as you get pregnant, you're automatically going to marry that guy. So I told him, I was like, hey, we have to get married. Like, I'm pregnant with your child. We have to get married. And the thought of being a single mom scared the crap out of me. I did not want to be a single mom. I didn't even know any single parents. Like, single moms did not exist. Single parents doesn't exist in the Amish culture unless your husband or your wife dies. But it just didn't exist. And it felt so scary so he was like, okay, yeah, we can get married, like, after you have the baby or whatever. Like, he was like, okay. So fast forward, I was sick, like, almost all nine months, morning sickness. I would wake up, still go to work, still worked, like, all nine months. And meanwhile, I had gotten a job at a factory, and I started out as a temporary. And I was also going to get my GED because I couldn't go full time unless I got my GED. Um, and I went in to get tested for my GED and they informed me that I had a sixth grade education. So I got all the books, got everything, you know, that I needed to study and like kept at it and started going to classes at night and started to really pour into my education. I loved learning. It was math was so frustrating for me though. The algebra and the trig, it was so frustrating <laughs> and I would cry a lot of nights because I couldn't figure it out. But had amazing tutors through the GED program to actually get me my high school education. I got that and then the plan was after I would have a baby that I wanted to go to school. And I had voiced this to him and I was like, hey, I really want to go to, I want to get a college education. And he'd be like, yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, whatever. Like just kind of ditched it. He's like, let's just get, get you through this pregnancy and then that's it, right? He just didn't, we just didn't want to talk about it because we had other things going on. And I kind of, like felt uneasy about it because it seemed like I wasn't supported to go get an education. But I just kind of dismissed it. And meanwhile, you know, he had still, he had started drinking and I saw the signs of the drinking, of the 
you know, you need to get a better job so you can support us. It wasn't about we support each other. It was never about that. And he had a really hard time keeping a job because of alcohol, anger issues, not being able to get along with people and all like the list goes on and on. Or he just hated it. Like he just didn't want to show up to work. And I knew like I took responsibility for us financially. And I that, that's what drove me. I knew I had to work hard. I worked 70, 80 hours a week in the factory, like seven days a week. And um, a lot of 10 and 12 hour days. And I knew that, you know, I had to do this to get us where we wanted to be financially. And I wasn't, I couldn't depend on him to help us get there. Fast forward, um, I had Jordan, my oldest, and the pregnancy by any means wasn't an enjoyable process because I was sick the entire time. And even, and I was alone. I was always alone. I went to all the doctor appointments by myself. I did even did the ultrasound by myself. And because he just didn't want to, he just didn't care. He just didn't want to be there. He's like, no, he's like, if you can go by yourself, just go by yourself. And so I did. I just didn't ask for like any support or any help. And um, the day that he was born was was one of like, it was a hard day. It was very hard because I didn't have my mom there. I always wanted my mom to be there and to like know that she was supporting me. And it was like a bittersweet moment because, you know, here I'm like, a baby now and I just didn't know what to think and knowing that I'm responsible for this human now no matter what and I always envisioned like when I got married and had kids that my husband would you know be super excited and we would like he would spend the night with me there at the hospital and do all the things you know that newly couples do but we weren't married right and after Jordan was born a couple hours, he was like, I'm going home. And I was like, what do you mean you're going home? Like, you're going to let me here at this hospital by myself? Like, we just had a baby. And he was like, well, why would I stay? And I just kind of put it back in that burner of like, you know what? It doesn't matter. Let him go. And I sat and I cried. And just hugged Jordan even tighter. <laughs> Because it broke my heart because it wasn't what I had planned, right? It wasn't what I had envisioned having a baby was going to be like. And, you know, it wasn't like one of those, even like going through the birthing classes alone, um, sitting there and seeing other couples together. And here I am by myself and I get asked like, oh, are you a single mom? I would just be like, yup. Like just owning that because it's like he wasn't there to support at all, ever. And so I, so we take Jordan home, you know, and he tells me, you know, he's like, Hey, you have to go back to work as soon as possible because financially we're not going to be able to make it. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he was like, we well, need to see how soon you can go back to work because we can't make it financially. Like the bills, we weren't being, we couldn't pay our bills. And, um, I remember at three weeks I had a doctor appointment with my doctor for me and for Jordan and all that. And I had told her that, hey, look, I need to go back to work because of financially purposes. And I lied to her and told her that I had a desk job and that I could do it. So three weeks later, after having him, I went back to work. And he babysat and his, you know, his mom helped and supported and stuff too. But I worried, I worried a lot if Jordan was going to be okay while I was at work. And working second shift was not easy as a mom. And I was still working seven days a week same amount of hours, I was exhausted and still expected to cook, clean, take care of everything um, and to juggle it all. And it, I was so stressed and so overwhelmed that there was times that Jordan was the only thing that brought me hope. And um, Jordan was a couple, a couple months old and we started arguing a lot. We had gotten married and it was literally just went to the courthouse and got married. Not how I envisioned my wedding day at all. It was awful. I knew in my heart that I shouldn't go through with it, but I thought, you know, this is this is what I have to do. I don't have a choice. I didn't feel like I had a choice. So we got married and we started arguing more and it seemed like 
he wanted to do less. He didn't want to work. He just wanted to be a stay at home dad. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Like I'm sitting here. I had gotten full time in my job. I was making good money, but I'm still working seven days a week and I couldn't pull myself out of it. And it just seemed like I wasn't spending any time with my son. And it's, it was so awful and I struggled with it. And I just, I had a hard time understanding where all these bills kept coming from because I wasn't involved. He was, he handled all the bills, everything, and just took the money. It just seemed like I was making the money and not seeing anything. Like I didn't buy myself anything. I barely bought clothes for Jordan. I didn't do anything for myself. Like I just poured into keeping the money for the bills because I knew that's what we had. He kept telling me like, we need more money to be able to make it. Meanwhile, he was gambling behind my back and I didn't know it. Betting on ball games, going to the casino, all these things. Drinking, starting at like 9 a.m. Because he would be drinking before I left for work at 2 p.m. And we started to argue because I was like, I can't keep going. And it was it was a rough couple of months. And, he, and we kept arguing back and forth. And he would tell me, you know, you're lucky that you have me because your family no longer wants you. Um, your family has already ditched you, so I'm all you have. So you'll never make it without me. That would be always this thing that he would tell me. And I knew I was like, okay, whatever, like he's right. And I had gotten Facebook and he started like checking my Facebook. And I'm like, what are you doing? It was because he didn't trust me. He thought I was cheating with someone. I never cheated. And I felt just such anger and bitter towards him because of the accusations because I didn't do that like I was so loyal and all I did was work and come home that's all I did and meanwhile I was thinking about you know man I need to be getting out because this is just not for me like this isn't for me and I hurt so much but yet I was so scared fear just kept me trapped there like I was like I can't be a single mom like that kept running on repeat I don't know how to be a single mom. And then I found out that I was pregnant with my youngest, Cameron. And uh, I was like, the day I found out I was pregnant, I could just, I remember thinking like, I can barely make it with one. How am I gonna do it with two? I was excited because now they would, you know, I would have two, they could play together. Um, I didn't know at the time it was going to be a boy and I was super excited that it was going to be two boys because they could grow up and, you know, be together. And um, I got to be this mom, but at the same time, I was still working so many hours that I was just burnt out and I didn't know what to do. So I told myself I would suck it up, stay in the marriage because this is what I needed. And this is the stability that I needed because I had two boys and I didn't know how to do it. And I had told him, like, I want to go back. We had multiple conversations about me going to college. And he was like, no, it's just not a good idea. And I even went to see a student advisor to see what I needed to start, you know, working towards it. And he got upset. He was like, no, you can't do it. You have, you're about to have two kids. You're, you need to work. Like, how are you going to do college? And I was like, well, I can do it online. But still, it, he just said, no, he's like, you can't, you, I'm not allowing it. And we would argue for hours about that. So Cameron was, Cameron was born and it was, it was bittersweet having a second child is like a part of me feels you know like oh my goodness like I'm losing my first child a baby but at the same time it was such a good it was so good for me to have like two boys now they could play together and um it was it was interesting because with Cameron it was completely different than with Jordan with having him because of the fact that I somewhat was prepared and didn't have this fantasy of like, this is how it's going to be to have a baby. Um, and he didn't spend the night with me at the hospital with Cameron. I literally left within hours after he was born. And I cried a lot because again, I wanted my mom. And I wanted that, that picture perfect of like, having your husband there and like being able to bond together with the baby because that's always like was my dream right it was my vision is what I wanted and I didn't get that and I cried a lot because I felt like I didn't get it because I felt like I didn't deserve it because I wasn't worthy because I went against everything my parents said and everything my parents said were, was coming true like you're not going to be able to do this and this you're, all these things are going to happen 
And so I take Cameron home and I go back to work after six weeks with Cameron and then I get laid off in like three days after that. <laughs> and then I got to spend a lot of time with the boys really bonding. Um, I went through a really trying time of just, I completely ditched God at one point because I hated him because I was so angry. Like how can God put me in this situation with such an abusive husband that just tells me that I am worthless one minute and then loves me the next. Like how does that happen? It was like a constant mood swing with him, constantly. He would come home, he would be drinking, and he would throw stuff. He would tell me that I'm a piece of shit and like I'm just whoring around behind his back and accuse me of all these things that never happened. And my oldest, Jordan, was starting to get older, old enough to realize what was going on. And one day, both the boys were playing on the floor and... Um, he came home and he was drinking. He had been drinking. He came home and for no reason at all, picked up all their toys and threw them out the door. And I can remember seeing the shock on my boys' face of what just happened. And I remember he goes, my old Jordan goes, why did he do that? And I just hugged both of them really tightly. And in that moment, I realized not only could I, I needed to get out for myself because I'd known that for years because I couldn't take the the abuse of it. I couldn't take the blaming and the, the endless verbal abuse and the one minute being nice and the next minute hating me and the next one minute accusing me of shit that I never did. But I knew I had to get out for my boys' sake. And then I started making a plan to leave. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I can remember telling my friend like, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I had very few friends because he, every friend that I did have, he was like, oh, they're not good for you. You need to stop hanging around with them. Like every person I wanted to hang out with, he's like, no, they're not good for you. The only person he would really allow me to was with my sister. And he would be like, no, they're not good for you. Like you don't, you don't want to be around them. They're just not good people. And I believed him. I believed him until I saw that it wasn't true. And then one day I was like, you know what? I'm just done. And I didn't tell him. I didn't tell him that I was what I was planning to do because I knew he would stop me because we had conversations before about me leaving. And he said, if you ever try to leave, you will not leave with these boys. These are my boys. You will not leave with him. And he kept telling me that over and over and over. And then I just started packing my stuff and putting it in a closet, knowing that one day I was going to leave. And that's what I did. One day I just up and left while he was at work. And I I was so scared because I knew that if he found out where I was gonna be, he was gonna come after me and just like make me come back. Like I, I was so scared. And uh, long story short, he did find out where I was at and he convinced me to come back. And I went back and try to make it work, you know, tried the counseling, tried his whole AA thing, but it didn't work. And two months later, I was right back in the same situation. And that time I told myself, I will get out and I will not look back. And I had everything packed up. I had my boys in the front. It was like in a truck. And he comes out and he's like, where do you think you're going? I said, I'm leaving. Like, I am done. I am done with you. I'm done with all of it. I packed everything up. And as I was getting ready to leave, he's like, you are not leaving. And he held like an ax over the front of my windshield and wouldn't allow me to leave. He's like, I'm going to crush this windshield. And I knew if I left and he crushed it, it was going to hit the boys. So I called, I had to call the cops to get out of it. Called the cops. They came. We finally got out of it. And from there started a nasty custody battle. I mean, nasty. There were times he would... We had, he got him every other weekend and one weekend they didn't come back. He didn't bring him back. The hardest thing that I have done as a mom is not knowing where my kids were at. He wouldn't allow contact and the cops, if you called the cops, they would tell you, hey, it's a custody battle and not to mention that he was friends with all the cops and the judges in the county that we lived in. He was, they were like, if it's a custody battle, we can't do anything for you. And you just need to, uh, 
take it up with the judge in the morning or on, on Monday morning. So this happened over the weekend. I didn't get them back and I didn't get my kids back until a Tuesday when I found out where they were at. They were at his sister's house. I showed up at his sister's house while he was at work and I said, I want my kids back and she refused to give them to me. And I saw my boys in the window. Like I saw them and she was like, well, they're not here. I said, I just saw them. So I had to call the cops to get my boys back. And it is so hard. And for any mom that ever goes through this, you know the pain of not having your children come back home to you. It was so painful. And I cried and I got super bitter and super angry. And we continued this battle over and over until it, w it lasted for several years. And he threatened to kill me across a voice message voicemail took the voicemail to the cops and they said there's nothing I can do about it and that was the moment I actually went and got a handgun bought a handgun to protect myself because I was like there's no way I'm going to keep living in fear and not knowing if he's going to walk through that door and I bought a handgun he would stalk me he would do the craziest stu stupid stuff he would tell my boys on the weekends he had my boys he would tell my boys how much their mom was a bitch or how their mom was a whore and I had to explain to my three and five-year-old what a whore was, what a bitch was. And I had to let them decide for themselves what their mom was. I didn't even try to justify it. I would just explain what it is and I moved on and I would sit and cry because how did my boys at this age be exposed to this? And then it started with my oldest of course he was older he understood more and he saw more and he saw the drinking and he was like yeah he was drinking and driving with us and I was like you know that that's like legal and like that's really really dangerous and he they would come home and tell me stuff and I know whenever my boys were at his house there was guardian angels with those boys because they would do stuff that would just blow my mind and him drinking and driving was just one of the things that he did and we continued the battle until, and I spent tons of money and tons of time in court just to fight for my boys, just to fight for them. It got to the point where they didn't want to go anymore. And one weekend, my oldest got, in, him and my oldest got into an argument. And he had told my oldest that your mom is nothing but a bitch. And my oldest had stood up to him and said, that is not true. And he said, if you feel like that, then you don't need to come back around anymore. Don't come back home. Don't come visit. And I, I'm keeping all your stuff. You don't get to take any of your stuff with you. And I can remember the weekend that he came home and told me that. My heart broke for my oldest. Because just like that, his dad had wrote him off. I just wrote him off. And didn't want to have anything to do with him. And I just held him as he cried. He cried. Forever because he didn't have a dad anymore. He didn't feel like he had a dad anymore. And then six months later, the same thing happened with my youngest. So that's how he walked away. And that's kind of how we, it, things are right now today is he doesn't have anything to do with them. If he does reach out, it's usually to try to stir up something. And now my boys are old enough to make that decision whether they want to have a relationship with their dad or not. That's really not my choice. My boys saw everything. They know the hurt. They know how it feels. And if you ask them now today, they'll be like, we don't want nothing to do with it. We don't, they don't want to go back through that. Um, that. That was the custody battle. And I'm going to leave it this to part two because we just went a long ways into the custody battle of it. And it's just bits and pieces of it. And then I will record a part three of um, my journey to going to school and how I joined a gym and lost 65 pounds and started powerlifting. That will be the part three of my story, even though it kind of happened in the same time as all of this um, custody battle stuff went through. And yeah, I'll be back with part three.